This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. Uh, my guest on the podcast today is assistant brewmaster and head of the Sour Program for August Shell Beer, Jace Marty. Welcome to the podcast, Jace. Thank you. Glad to be on. Here from Minnesota yeah. up, uh, at the Great American Beer Festival here in Colorado. Absolutely. Excited to be back. Cool. So we're going to talk about uh, a whole bunch of things uh, from their Sour Beer Program, the Star Keller Program that they've built out, uh, as well as some of their new approaches to classic lagers. You know, obviously, Shell's is a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, established, long-brewing lager brewer mm-hmm. um, with a, a lot of tradition behind it, and uh, yet they've been pushing some new boundaries in, uh, in lagers as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about Sour Beer. Uh, uh, but first, as the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, GD Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, reliability, and dedication to their customers' craft. For 25 years, GD has led the way with innovative solutions for the craft brewing industry. Contact GD Chillers today at 1 800 555 0973 or reach out online at gdchillers.com. Mention the Craft Beer and Brewing podcast to receive up to $1,000 worth of glycol with the purchase of any new GD Chiller unit. Also, Tavor is the tastiest way to explore the world from the comfort of your home. Select delicious craft beers on the Tavor app that you cannot find in your area and get them delivered right to your door. It's not a beer of the month club where you end up with duds you have to give to your grandpa. Download the free Tavor app today and get $10 in beer money with code BREWING. Jace, so let's talk about uh, your arc in brewing. It's yeah. ten, that tends to be how we start these kinds of things yeah, off, just to uh, to see you know uh, how you developed, how you got to where you are, and uh, what stoked your interest in brewing, how you got here. Mm-hmm. Um, so August Shell Brewing Company, uh, we've been around next year's 160th anniversary, and it's our family business. So I'm the sixth generation of uh, the Shell family, and so I've grown up in brewing. Uh, it's been a part of my- It's like you were born for this. Yeah, part of, part of my whole life. Um, but I've been working full time at the brewery for 19 years. Uh, started just started in high school, and I've been working ever since. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I don't hear that story very often. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it, technically, even before that too. I mean, my dad made us do a lot of uh, really crappy jobs as, as little kids, and <laughs> so got got some experience of that uh, at a young age, and have been working my way up through there ever since. Um, yeah, in high school, I started off uh, doing you know washing a lot of kegs, and uh, you know. We were still doing returnables at the time, so uh, you know, stacking the returnable cases, putting them on the line, stuff like that. Uh, went to college, I studied design. So um, when I came back, I was it was doing a lot of our like advertising stuff and got a lot of experience with like the sales side of things and work with yeah. distributors. And then uh, transitioned over into the the brewing side of things. Went to went to brewing school at the VLB in Berlin. And uh, yeah, been been in the brewing side ever since. So when you started working for August Shell uh, way back in the day, or when you grew up at the brewery, it was yeah. a little different place than it is now. Absolutely, it was a very different place. Talk to me about how you know. I mean, and craft beer has become a thing. You all have been obviously family owned for for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the beer world has kind of changed around you. Um, talk to me a little bit about how Shell uh, saw that landscape and has watched that landscape changed and has uh, you know kind of grown and adapted to the new uh, new beer market. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I was one year old, not even one year old, uh, that's when my dad introduced our pills and our Hefeweizen. And those were our first two craft beers uh, at August Shell Brewing Company, all malt beers. Yeah. Um, we'd always done a Bach beer, so I guess we'd been doing crap beers before that but yeah. that was kind of our first foray uh we were we signed on with uh Merchant du Vin shortly after that and so we had uh, a lot of distribution through that realm and you know as i was growing up kind of in the late 80s uh, early 90s we were doing the bulk uh, of production is american light lager yeah yeah i mean our, our shells deer brand is right. that, that was our that's our beer you know it was introduced yeah. in 1912 that's that's been our flagship ever sure, since sure um, so we did a lot of that growing up. Uh, you know, the brewery was pretty quiet. The the, the, the eighties were not a great time for yeah, breweries. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, production, I would go there every day after school. We were usually shut down. It was quiet, but you know, got to play on all the malt bags and climb on <laughs> things I shouldn't be climbing on. But, yeah. um, you know, we started doing a lot of contract brewing at that time, uh, into the early nineties. And so I remember, you know, I always seen all the, you know, as a little kid, it was really cool to see all the different artwork on the boxes and right. the, the different designs and stuff like that. So, 
uh, and, and also to, you know, look, you know, where they're going, you know, what states, you know, if it's California or Missouri or whatever, you know, all kinds of different states like that. So, um, and then we kind of, you know, we had expanded our craft portfolio as well. And, uh, you know, into the like late nineties, early two thousands, we, you know, kind of wanted to get back to just doing our own production. So in 2002, uh, we bought the rights to the grain belt label. Um, and that afforded us to get out of the contract game and just focus on our own brands. And so, uh, we've been doing all of our own beers ever since, obviously, uh, you know, a mix of, uh, all malt craft beers and, and American lagers as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, when I think about August Shell, I think about that that kind of craft side of things. And there were mm-hmm. beers like uh, Firebrick, where uh, um, you know are kind of out of the mainstream. Uh, nobody's no, uh, at the scale that you are making them, yeah. making that style of beer. Um, talk to me a little bit about that August Shell focus on some of these beer traditions that may not seem as cool or hip to uh, some <laughs> of the uh, other brewers out here, but yeah. are actually, I think, you know, probably regaining uh, popularity. Vogue, right, right. Not coming back, coming into vogue finally. Yeah. Uh, no, I coming mean, into vogue on the yeah on the craft side. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, we're we're the second oldest family owner in the country, and so we we pride ourselves in our tradition and our yeah. in our German heritage. August Shell was an immigrant, um, and so we've really focused on you know mainly traditional German styles of beers. And so even from like when we first entered craft brewing, it was a Pilsner and a, and a Weizen or yeah. a, a half a Weizen. Um, and we've really stuck with that is, is our core lineup of beers have been traditional styles. So like our Firebrick, uh, Vienna Lager, uh, a Pilsner, a Hefeweizen, um, you know, not beers that are going to get the, the, you know, modern beer geek really excited about. But uh, it, it's more about who we are as, as a company and, and that fits in our, in our mantra. How have uh, some of those styles changed over the years that you all have been brewing them? Yeah, uh, you know, going back to those two originals, those have evolved over the years. And yeah. I think that's my dad being, uh, you know, willing to adapt and not, not being yeah. so, like, ingrained and just, like, we got to be traditional. This is how we've always done it. You know, this is the way it's going to be. Um, I think to be successful, to stay the same, you have to change, if that makes any sense. Sure, sure. Um, well, you know, for the drinkers, you know, who are drinking this beer, their context changes, right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. What they, the other things that they're drinking changes, and they're trying new flavors, and they're, they're, you know, trying other examples of these kinds of styles, and so, at times, their expectations change. I mean, you know, the even the Anheuser-Busch uh, scientists are reformulating that beer all the time, and test marketing it, right, in order to uh, uh, just make sure that they're groups that are, uh, you know, the, the people and the consumers out there are perceiving it in the same kind of way, because whether we're talking about beer or whether you're talking about food or coffee or anything else, I mean, our palates shift over, you know, uh, years and especially absolutely. over decades. Yeah, absolutely. And, and ingredients change too. You yeah. Know, when we introduced our pills, it was hundred percent six row. <laughs> um, and it, it's pretty hard to find six row these days now. Yeah. And so it's evolved into two row. Uh, back then it was, bitter, you know, it, it followed our deer brand recipe and going back to, you know, the early 1900s is you bittered with American hops. Uh, back then it was, would have been cluster. Yeah. Uh, in 84, it was cascade. And then you finished with your, your nice German nobles. And so that was a hollow town middle fruit, uh, you know, 25 IBUs, very mildly bitter, not aromatic. Um, and the Hefeweizen was a, it was a crystal vice and it was filtered because, Good luck selling a, a cloudy beer right. in, in 1984. <laughs> and nowadays, I mean, you know, some of the beers look like it's the tank bottoms. And so uh, having an unfiltered Hefeweizen is perfectly acceptable to today's consumer, where back then it is, was absolutely not. Yeah. So those have evolved. Uh, our Pilsner is now on kind of its our fourth generation or, or iteration. Um, 100% Weyermann uh, Barca Pils, which is just a fantastic malt. Uh, we do a little when you say that, what do you, what is it about the Barca that, uh, you find, uh, appealing? It's just got just this complexity and, and, and depth of flavor yeah. that is, it's just, it's hard to, to mimic. Um, you know, and we, we've tried to replicate it with, with North American malts and you can get close, but there's just something that's, it's hard to put your finger on that. It's just, it, you know, just is distinctly German, you know, and, and it's, right. it's, uh, you know, Part of it has to do with just barley genetics and, and breeding in North America and how it's very different than European varieties. That's an old world uh, land trace variety, and it's just it's just it's a, it's a special barley variety and it's a, yeah. it's a special malt. So I think it, it really um, makes for a fantastic pilsner. And then we we use uh, kind of as a twist is we wanted to use all newer German varieties that are still 
kind of noble in their heritage and they're low alpha. Um, so we, we uh, you know, a heavy middle edition of, of Sapphire, which mm. has a nice kind of a lemony character to it. And then uh, a big late edition Whirlpool and, and Dry Hop with Callista, which is a fairly new uh, new German variety, two point eight alpha, you know, super low, yeah. low alpha, but it's got <clears throat> uh, a really cool uh, kind of a, a floral fruit character to it that I think is, is is really interesting, and it you know helps differentiate yourself from a from a Pilsner standpoint. Um, how important? What is I mean, how, what does that mean? Differentiate yourself from a Pilsner standpoint. I mean, there is certainly the expectation of of what a consumer has for a Pilsner when they drink it, mm-hmm. based on the idea of of style and pills. Um, you know, and it's a fine line to create something that's a little different, unique, and has character um, without stepping outside of that expectation. How, you know, as you think about these beers, how do you ride that line? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a big thing with us in Shells is we're not a new brewery. And with, you know, nearly 10,000 breweries now in the country, it's it's even harder for us to to get attention from consumers right. because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, what's new, what's new. And especially when it, a brand that's been around forever, you know, people like whether you've had it or not, I, I know it's always been there. So uh, maybe the, the willingness to try that brewery is, is not quite as high as, you know, a, right. a new one. Um, but then for us, it's, it's trying to find that balance of being traditional and also new at the same time. So putting just a subtle twist on it, you know, with, with new varieties that are maybe not a, a traditional Pilsner variety, but they come from traditional, you know, German hop growing, you know, or hop character. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's trying to give it, you know, be traditional and, and with a twist. Is, is kind of what we should is that appeal to familiarity, but it just you know it's almost like what you need to do to win a competition, like Great American Beer Festival. It has to be like dead in that style, but just have something that sets it out, mm-hmm. and so that it's not the uh, not the right down the middle. Yeah, you know? and, and you know to, to win competitions is not what we seek set course, out to be. We, we're just trying to make beers that uh, we enjoy drinking, and there's you know typically or you know traditional session style lagers, and um, but yeah, it's got more of a hop character without like the the overriding like bitterness yeah. it's it's 35 ibus it's like i said it's a huge middle edition which right. uh, you know you don't see a whole lot but it, it gives you a lot of that hop flavor huh. without like that that you know rough bitterness i guess yeah so how much expectation now since this beer has been around since the 80s how much expectation of your customers uh, uh you know do they have for consistency through that and how willing are they to kind of move with you as you uh, make some of these tweaks there was there was definitely some some blowback when yeah. we got rid of the old recipe. Yeah, the new was, Coke uh, yeah, uh, experience sure. there. Yeah, but it, you know I don't think it's it's not like it's we went from a yeah. you know a hazy yeah. lactose IPA in, you know from our traditional pills. It's it's very much still a traditional pills, or it's subtle tweaks. Yeah, um, you know we got our water profile dialed in. We do an extensive mashing. Um, you know our lagering. It's the same same yeast that we've been using. So there's a lot of familiarities, but then there's also those subtle tweaks too, like where we're using. In the last edition, that was all American, uh, you know, raw or two row. Now we went to German. Same with the, it was American Sterling. Right. Now we went to, to German hot variety. So, building character in such light beers is a real challenge. Yeah, you know, building that character, and you've got a few levers that you can pull. You can, you know, pull on hops. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned you pull on the malt lever, um, but another lever that you can pull is how you treat those ingredients through the hot side process. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about uh, what that looks like for you all in order to kind of. Um, you know, add some uh, some tooth and some character to uh, you know to the body of these beers. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our brew house, uh, we got a, a mid '90s Nair brew house, which is now Esau and Huber, uh, four vessel system, and we can do step mashes and decoction mashing. So, um, you know, being traditional, we wanted to have a traditional uh, German brew house. So for us mashing, um, we start with a very soft water profile. We're at like 35 ppm carbonate, carbonate hardness. Um, so treating that pretty extensively. Um, to get that very soft water profile. Mashing, we do all step mashes. Um, we do some decoction mashes. Our, our pills, we just just don't with this this new iteration, but um, most of our sour beers, we, we do a lot of decoction hmm. mashing. So uh, step mashing with this one, we're, we're going for a very, very dry beer. Um, I think dryness equates to drinkability. Yeah, um, yeah. And when you, they get cloying, it, it makes them hard to, to have a, a bunch more. So uh, we do three steps. So mashing at 62, uh, we do a, 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 for like, 30 minutes, 65 for 10 minutes, and then um, the final rest at 72, and then mashing out at, at uh, 78. So pretty long mash. Um, mm-hmm. Like I said, it's 100% Weirman Pilsner malt, which is just, it's a great malt. It's very, um, runs off great in the brew house. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful malt to work with. So lautering is, is kind of as is. 
Um, boiling, we, um, you know, 60 minute, we have a good uh, evaporation driving off DMS, so that's not a, not a big issue for us. So, um, like I said, the multiple additions, focusing more on those middle additions, yeah. I just I, th- I think that uh, with traditional German Pilsners, I think a lot of those that have that middle character that is is very different. It kind of goes against you know American brewing, and that's just more of that traditional way of beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah uh, doing with that, and then um, you know obviously adapting to to modern profiles and and consumer preferences so focusing uh, heavily on the aroma so it's a big whirlpool edition and then a dry hop as well yeah and then also uh, you know with our dry hop too kind of adapting some of that new research that's coming out with like uh new england nice style ipas of like dry hopping on day one or, yeah. you know, or 24 hours in so that one we uh, we did a bunch of trials and uh, at different dry hop with your time. pilsner with the pilsner dry yeah. hopping <laughs> during so ferment, active fermentation. We dry hop at twenty four hours. <laughs> it's typically a, a ten day ferment, huh. and it it definitely lends a different character to it. Interesting. And, and we had them where we you know dry hop day one, uh, you know mid fermentation, and then dry hopping at the end. And uh, it was preferred and blind that we we all like the the day one dry hop. Which Interesting. Is, what is crazy would, for us to yeah, that <laughs> as is, an old brewery, kinda, that's you know, fascinating. How um, you know from a sensory standpoint, how do you how would you describe the difference? Um, it seemed, I mean these are gotta be very fine points. Yeah, but. it was it was. Uh, it seemed like the later editions and even like the static, you know, non uh, not during active fermentation, you got a little more vegetal character. Okay, and uh, it it seemed more integrated. Uh, okay, when and you get some of that bio transformation that's happening, so you get some of those brighter bio transformation uh, <laughs> with your lager yeast in a pilsner. I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a cold ferment too. I mean, we were pitching at uh, forty eight Fahrenheit free rise into 52 uh-huh. so it's a it's a nice cold fermentation um you know so you're not getting a lot of those bright fruit characteristics but it's also we're you know we're working with a 2.8 alpha uh german hop variety too it's, it's not a you know right. a citra mosaic or something like that that's going to just blow you know rip your face off with fruit character it's a it's a very different it's this fruit floral character uh-huh. uh, that you know noble character modern noble i guess is kind of how we describe it and then you drop hops and, and lager for a while. Yep, yep. Um, we we naturally carbonate all of our beers, so huh. with about two degrees left of fermentation, we spoon them. Uh, it's just a pressure relief valve right. uh, that's fully carbonated. Uh, we cool it down. Uh, we have horizontal lagering tanks, so we uh, lager four weeks, and then uh, it's packaged. Sounds pretty classic. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, kind of moving to, to you know talking how you are uh, uh, taking that lager style and some uh, newer, more yeah you know, I shouldn't say more creative because that's a incredibly creative way to make a pilsner. Yeah. But before we get into that conversation, this episode is brought to you by Brew Guru, the free mobile app that alerts you to local discounts on beer, food, and homebrewing supplies. Created by the American Homebrewers Association, Brew Guru is your essential guide to brewing and drinking great beer. Start with a thirty day free trial. No credit card info required when you download Brew Guru for iPhone or Android. And balancing barley and hops is your expertise, and for Clarion Lubricants, Food Grade Lubricants is theirs. The team at Clarion knows that when it comes to making great beer, you're the expert, and when it comes to supplying food grade lubricants backed by service oriented professionals, they're the experts. Clarion will work with you to create an efficient lubrication program that helps protect your brewery. To speak with an expert, dial 1 855 My Clarion. That's 855 692 5274. Or visit ClarionLubricants.com. Clarion Lubricants, the expert that experts trust. So one of the uh, beers that stuck out to me that you uh, sent to us probably a year or two ago was mm-hmm. uh, Citra Blanc. Yeah. Um, you know, it was uh, ostensibly uh, in, uh, India Pale Lager. Um, to me, it didn't hit me as quite as heavy-handed as that might sound, uh, you know, from a acronym definition kind of standpoint. It was both what I expected out of a bright, pale lager and had that nice lager character to it, but at the same time, it was a soft and uh, clear expression of the citra hop mm-hmm. um, that didn't go on to the, that f- Full, over the top, mind blowing citrus. Yeah, uh, you know that we are now getting out of those hazy IPAs, but mm-hmm. uh, but really kind of captured the the spirit of it and presented it in this kind of clean and nice forward way. Talk to me a little bit about how you um, envisioned the, that uh, or and created that beer, um, you know, and what they what the inspiration was, and then how you went about kind of building that clarity into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we a couple years earlier we had done a fresh hop. Um, lager beer with citra 
and I just really liked how that it played with the lager yeast character, that that interaction with it, you know the more sulfur that you get off right. of, a, of a lager fermentation. And I think it just ex- shows itself a little differently than an ale fermentation. And I, I like the blend of German and American hops of, of kind of drawing in the traditional, you know, hop growing regions and then also Americanizing it as well. And I thought just Hallertau Blanc, um, you know, is maybe like the, the German equivalent of, of like a Citra and that it's, it's, it's of the new German varieties, that's the most, the boldest one. Um, and it, it definitely lends itself really well to that, the lager yeast character again with the, this, that floral and, and the sulfur character. And I just thought that if the citra, if you got more of that floral characteristic, that those would play really well together. And that, that was kind of our, you know, what we set out to do. And then also, um, incorporate a little bit of Bravo, uh, with that journey and all the, the, the research that's been done, uh, talking with Stan around us quite a bit about that. And it's just as a flavor enhancer. So kind of playing with those three things, uh, to see how they interacted from a, from a hop standpoint. Tell me a little bit more about that, uh, that journey. <laughs> I forget who did it. Uh, Stan loves talking about these I hops. Know, I know. And I'm, I'm a little rusty on the research now. We just did it, but, uh, it was, he basically, I thought it was a, a Japanese paper that, that identified it. And then they said that you can use certain hop varieties that You're were right, really it was high. The Sapporo brewery, yeah, wasn't Sapporo. It? Right, that, right. They identified hop varieties that were really high in geraniol, and that if you blended them in at smaller concentrations with other varieties, it acts right. as an amplifier. And so we we tried that again with a lager, um, and using like a ten percent blend of Bravo in with this Citra and Hallertau Blanc, and you know it's hard to we didn't do it sure, side by side, sure. but I, I was happy with the results, so I thought it was a cool cool experiment. How do you build a, you know, is the, the kind of body and base, uh, malt base to that, uh, similar to your other lo- or light pale lagers or, uh, uh, did you tweak that in some way to kind of bring out some of these flavors? No, it was, it was pretty simple. It was a lot of Pilsner malt, um, again with Weyermann and then, uh, we used Munich. Um, I think it was like 8% Munich, Yeah, you know, just a, a little bit of sweetness, but still, you don't want anything cloying, uh, no, no heavy caramel malts or anything. So it was still a bright golden beer, but you know, add a little more body to it with the Munich malt. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, let's ch- uh, switch gears a little bit. Uh, you know, another kind of modern development for August Shell has been a move into sour beer. Yeah, you know, so you know, you obviously you start getting into craft, you know, making these craft styles in the '80s, and then you develop this craft program further on. But a few years ago, you all went all in on a whole uh, uh, sour, uh, you know, the Star Keller sour uh, facility. Yeah. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about that. There's a beautiful story about uh, tying that into the tradition of the brewery that yeah. I think is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is definitely a, a passion project of mine and, and one I think is, um, again, showing us being traditional and, and innovative the same way. And it, this whole, our whole sour program um, is based off of 10 wooden tanks that we have. And these 10... Um, their lagering tanks. They were built in 1936 inside the brewery, and we used them uh, in continuous production from 1936 up until 1991. And they were our lagering tanks. Uh, in addition to other ones, it was a way for us to. So you guys were making wood aged lagers yeah. uh, b- before it became cool again a couple of years ago. Here. Yeah, yeah. It, it may have also been had a little sourness to them, <laughs> so unintentionally. <laughs> okay. Uh, just because you can't clean wooden tanks, but right. Um, but it was a way for us to cheaply add capacity because we had no money post prohibition. We hadn't made sure, money. Sure. So to meet demand, uh, to add production capacity, we, we added these wooden tanks and they were used to make deer brand. I mean, that was, they were lagering tanks for that. Um, when we stopped using them in 91, two years later, we put eight of the 10 tanks into storage, but we left two in that cellar at the brewery. And I, I remember them being there my whole life, you know, growing up and, um, I always thought they were kind of odd, but, you know, as a little kid, I didn't understand. But uh, as I, you know, my craft beer journey, you know, got me uh, hooked on sours. And Rodenbach was the beer that uh, I first fell in love with with sour beers. And then just doing research on them and then seeing the pictures of their cellars, I'm like, well, we have have tanks just like those. (laughs) Like, what if we use them to make sour beers? And and for us, you know, with, with 10,000 breweries now in the country, you got to stand out somehow. And, and sure. I think by that you, you specialize. And so for us, it's always been traditional German style beers. Right. And so, it, you know, I was homebrewing a bunch and I got into Berliner Weiss, which was a, a German style of sour beer. And I thought, well, this, this, we could do this. We could make 
these German style sour beers using our old wooden tanks. And it was this <laughs> crazy idea of trying to convince my dad for, for years, like, Hey, we should, we should make sour beers with it, you know, and stuff like that. Um, and when we finally got the go ahead, we, we started trying to restore this tank. And so we, they, I mean, they were, what year did you start working on them about two, this? 2008. Really? Um, okay. It, it, didn't start originally as a sour program, but it, we wanted to make a, an anniversary beer for 150th anniversary. Sure. Uh, but they were dilapidated. I could sh- fit my fingers in the gaps of the staves. They had dried out terribly. <laughs> um, and so we had a, a chance meeting with uh, Cooper uh, from northern Minnesota that w- was selling laser-etched barrel heads, which are amazing when he bought a bunch. Uh, but I, I just asked him, are, are you a real Cooper, and can you help me with this project? He's like, yeah, absolutely. And... Uh, he gave us some pointers, and we went into the museum, grabbed our original Cooper tools that we still have, and we used those to restore the tank um, to kind of reset the hoops and everything and, and, and slowly got it to rehydrate over the course of the year. Uh, and then we kind of missed that window, but then we, that's when we shifted gears into sour. So um, we needed to get rid of the wax on the inside. They were pitch-lined because mm, we, right, we were right. making loggers. You didn't want that wood character. So we... Um, hired a dry ice blasting company to remove all the pitch on the inside. Uh, and then we had, a, you know, essentially a new wooden tank that was 80 years old. And uh, we brewed a sacrificial beer into it uh, that sat for four months and did nothing, which is exactly what we wanted to happen. And then we started uh, with our Berliner. Just to suck it. the wood character out of it? or We, we didn't know what to expect. Right, like right. I said, it had been empty for almost 20 years. Sure, you know, sure. It could have, it could have gone any number of directions. So right. we just wanted to, to see what was going to happen. Um, you know, and, and also what the wood character would be like. And at 80 years old, there's, there's basically no wood character left. So, um, like I said earlier, I had studied at the VLB and, um, made it my just personal mission to learn everything about that style while I was over there. And, uh, you know, found as many old bottles as I could online, you know, Craigslist and eBay and uh, a lot of lost in translation sure, conversations, sure. but, um, brought some bottles back. And, and so we started our program. Uh, we brewed the first one in 2012 and released it in 2013. And it's made entirely, um, in the traditional way of making them mixed culture fermentation from strains that are, came from closed East German Berliner Weissbury's. So talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, that's the uh, kind of interesting thing about what be- what are called Berliner Weisses today. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's uh, it, I mean, obviously it, it's making a, a comeback now in Berlin also, but it was for the most part lost there. There was not a lot of uh, ongoing, consistent tradition around it. Um, the way American, most American brewers picked it up uh, was through a kettle sour process. Yeah. Um, and you made a very conscious effort to not do it that way. Well, when we started, I didn't know the kettle sour process existed. <laughs> uh, and it, it was No, it was talked about at school, but I just never put whatever. I didn't think it was right. a thing to do. Right. I, you know, that wasn't how it was made the traditional way. Yeah. Um, and I, I give a lot of talks about Berlin. I'm, I'm, uh, one of the really cool things about I, I know, it's an interesting thing about Berliner Weiss. Kettle souring originated in Berlin, so it is actually a way of making Berliner Weiss. But it was created by a brewery that was having pediococcus infections. And this brewer invented this method of production to address the pedio uh, hmm. infections that he was having. And that was a problem because all, you know it turns ropey in the bottle, right, right. and then it eventually goes away, but you have to sit in those bottles for a long time. It was costing him money, so he patented this... Uh, it's called the Franca acidification method, and uh, it was universally rejected, and he went out of business a year later. <laughs> Patented this method of production. Huh. It got written about in all these trade journals because Berlin is a, a very brewing sure, uh, technical sure. city, but it never never went anywhere. This this guy patented this method that nobody used, and the consumers didn't like what the beer tasted like. Hmm. Um, flash forward 100 years, and you know, as craft brewers, when you are trying to replicate traditional styles, you look to the city – or area where it's made from and, and taste the beers that it's, you know, to replicate from. Um, well, you know, you're left with Berliner Kindel is the only one that was still being made. Uh, and that one is actually not a kettle sour, but it tastes very much like a kettle sour. Okay. They do a split fermentation. Um, it's called the Barack method of production. Uh, they do just a straight lactic fermentation, a regular beer fermentation. They blend them, sterile filter them, and then that's, that's the beer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it tastes very much like a kettle sour. It's very you know, uh, lactic heavy, there's no Brett character to it. So right. it tastes like a kettle sour. So you put that, what you're tasting with what was written about a hundred years ago, I'm like, Oh, two and two, that's what it's supposed to taste like. And that's how we get 
what Berliner Weiss sure. is in the United States, even though it's really actually far from what the what was more traditionally, common, yeah. yeah, traditionally was made. Yeah, I, I think it has. Traditionally, it's more in line with like a you know a Flanders Red or like a you know a Patris H Pale, and that it was a, it was a mixed culture fermentation. Huh. Brett was a predominant characteristic of the beer, although not like aggressive like a lambic type of a Brett character, but that dryness that you get from the you know right. the attenuation from Brett it was absolutely a vital uh, part of that characteristic. So then, how did you set about creating a culture that would represent uh, you know a Berliner Weiss uh, from August Shell? Yeah, I mean it was. I had, was homebrewing it and, and playing with Brett strains, um, but you know, a five gallon glass carboy is very different than a four thousand five hundred sure, sure. uh, gallon cypress wood fermenter <laughs> or a uh, lagering tank. Uh, and so it was a bit of just you know pushing the beer in a direction and hoping it's going to go where you want it to be. Uh, and it, it, it turned out well. I, the the Bretts that we had were very delicate, like I said, as far as like aroma profiles, but very nice. Mm -hmm. Um, but you get that dryness and and that's a big, big component of as well. So, um, you know, it was a bit taking a, taking taking a leap of faith and (laughs) seeing what happened. How do you keep that kind of bread and balance to, you know, so that it doesn't become a completely bread dominated beer because, you know, having tasted these beers, there definitely is a, they are, there is bread there, but it becomes this nice back note. That's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not, Right up there and, and kind of dominating the Yeah, it's the not spirit. full on barnyard and, right. and, and funk. Um, I think that just it comes from the strains themselves. Um, okay. The strains, we're not using any commercially available strains as far as I know, unless they've been harvested and, and repitched. Uh, I just think that they're just delicate strains. Okay. Um, we use two primary. Where did you source them from? Or did you, or did you uh, capture them yourselves? Or? One was one came from the Vilna Rice Brewery. Uh, oh. The other one's from the Groderian Brewery. Okay. Uh, one's a Bruxellensis and one's a Clasenii. The, the Brux is, um, I would say, a little more robust and in, in like traditional in its flavor, but delicate, you know, kind of that spicy yeah. fruit character. The Clasenii works very slowly, but it has a really awesome, like, uh, pineapple, tropical flavor. And so we try and uh, design beers around the flavor profile that you're going to get from one or the other. Yeah. Um, and the, the Brett is, is, is very stable in the bottle, I think, and it um, lasts for a long time. The Clasenia is a little more delicate uh, in that it, it doesn't have quite the robustness to hold up to years in the, in the bottle. It, it has a shorter shelf life, I would say, than the, the Brock strain. Now, do these uh, uh, is all of the uh, Starkeller Sour program using the same strain, or do you uh, now have some more microbiological diversity among these multiple <laughs> tanks? Yeah, so we've uh, of the ten tanks, we try and keep have. have a, a, Brett specific tanks, uh, you know, either Brux, Clasenia, or a blend of two. And while we have since added uh, two tanks now, one um, cultured strains out of the Hochschule Brauerei, was a, a brewery that closed in 82. Um, and that had a blend of like six or seven Brett strains that we just propagated together and pitched in there. Um, and so that has a very really distinct character. And then another one that we're doing is, is a project I'm really excited about, trying to replicate Schulteis, which was the last Berliner Weiss, uh, traditionally made one that closed in 2006. Hmm. Um, and that out of the bottle had like a dozen Brett strains and you know, wow. half a dozen lacto strains in it. So, and um, something that was really cool, I, through you know online contacts and, and Melk the Funk, I met a, a German beer historian that actually interviewed the brewmaster of Schulteis, the last one. And he has all the records yet and is, is as passionate about it today as he was back then. And the amount of painstaking effort that went into making a 2.9 percent alcohol <laughs> beer is, it, it we, we had this, this conversation about it. Like it can't exist anymore today. Yeah, like how they were making it, you have to be unbelievably inefficient or like have a massive like demand for your product. Yeah. Um. They 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 uh you know just like the the quick overview of it is they they had this mixed culture that they were just constantly repitching. And so it was like evolved into this very robust and stable mixed culture. Um, and so when they would brew the beer, they would uh, acidify the wort with aged beer to bring the pH down to like a 4.2. Um, they'd primary ferment it and they'd move into the stainless um, where it would sit for three months. And the guy would, every day would walk by with a hammer and whack the tanks because it produces kind of a, a lot of sulfur <laughs> to drive off the sulfur. Um, and, and so for three months it would age, they would monitor the acidification and then that packaging, they would then, um, take 
one day fermenting beer and croizen it with that mixed culture again of that had been acidified with the three month old beer. So it was this crazy of that they were constantly always uh, back adding aged sour beer and that it was you made this very stable from a flavor profile uh, standpoint, but also extremely complex because you were constantly, you know, that aged beer that you're always adding back kept getting older. And it was like a sourdough process where, you know, that beer was probably 100 years old that they were constantly adding back that, you know, it was just yeah, kept going, yeah. and, you know, living on perpetually. Uh, so to try and recreate that, we've tried to do that with our beer. Uh, we could not hit that acidity that they were getting in three months. So when we're, we're going to package it this year. And I'd like to, like I said, make it to very inefficient and move it to our pilot scale system where we're trying to constantly then rebrew it on a very small scale where you're constantly adding back and then aging it and pack, you know, adding back again yeah. packaging. So we're going to try and replicate it as best we can. So recreating that kind of, you know, historical approach to Berliner Weiss, um, you know, certainly hits that, that uh, you know, historical approach and, and that kind of focus on tradition that Shells has. Well, at the mm-hmm. same time, actually creating something new to the world that has been lost and, you know, in one way or another, um, you know, what else, uh, you know, what other types of progression are you pushing towards with this, you know, star Keller program? Um, and what is getting you excited about, uh, some of the you know, other projects that you're working on? Yeah. I, I, the beer that we just released now that I'm extremely excited about is kind of, uh, has its, you know, what, what got me to sour is in my homage to Rodenbach. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of, we call it like a, a Berlin style Flanders red, <laughs> which, uh, taking our, you know, the traditional Berliner Weiss process with a Flanders red malt barrel, right. uh, heavy wheat based, and then fermenting it like a Flanders, uh, with all of our Berliner Weiss strains. So it's kind of a hybrid of the two worlds, more mm-hmm. of like a lactic forward, uh, Flanders red, and then age it for six months on, on Michigan, uh, Montmorency cherries, and then another year in the bottle, uh, bottle conditioning. So I think it's, uh, one I'm I'm ex- extremely excited about just because it, Rodenbach was the beer that got me into sours, and I wanted to always make a you know, kind of a nod to them. Um, but also seeing how similar and different yet they are uh, from that traditional style, where that you know may has more of like a acetic character, where ours is more lactic forward. But yeah, you know just the the similarities with the malt bills and stuff, I think is kind of a cool hybrid of the style. Um, another beer we're going to release next year's our 160th anniversary, and I. Um, we did a American adjunct lager base um, made in the Berliner Weiss style again, but the mixed culture fermentation was was bacteria and lager yeast, and that's been aging for three years, and it was kind of like an a, a imperial whatever. Uh, I don't even know what you want to call it, American <laughs> Weiss or something like that, um, but it's got this really interesting Riesling character, huh. like a uh, Riesling wine character that I think is a combination of the, the Bretts playing off the corn and the, the sulfur from the, the lager yeast fermentation. So it's a completely different flavor profile than any of the other beers we have out there. And I think a big component of that is the corn and lager yeast and how that interacts with the Brett. Interesting. And then also three years and three years of aging. Yeah. Are there any other ways that you use those kinds of ingredients and flavors to, you know, to kind of feed the Brett? Um, you know? Yeah. You know, with this learning sour beers and, and Berliner Weiss, right. it's, it's a very long feedback loop, you know, sure, one sure. to two years Take of make time a, to a tweak yeah. and then wait, see what happens and, and adjust from there. Um, so right now we actually have a bunch of beers that are coming up on like two years of aging because we, we went from, from mashing for dryness to mashing with heavy dextrins. Okay. And just reading things about people saying, oh, you know, Brett needs all this food, 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 whatever. So we were going into the wood tanks with a lot of residual and Brett just, stops working because it's you know we say it's fat and happy it's got all the food it needs it doesn't have to work hard and so as these have just taken almost twice as long to mature where in the past you know we were going into the wood tanks fairly dry that bread is already in a, a state of stress and so it yeah. starts to work a lot quicker that's that so. is interesting i mean I, and i guess you're right there's that uh, that kind of rodenbach or new belgium approach of where because mm-hmm. all the new belgium bases are are you know lagers fully fermented yeah. lagers before they're uh you know pitched into into fooders um you know and I, I hadn't actually conceived of how that might differ from that kind of lambic and goose process of heavy dextrin malt where there's plenty of hard to eat food the brat can just sit there and work on for a long 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 time um, but it is kind of fascinating from a production brewery standpoint if you're not trying to have stuff sit in a tank for many many years then uh, you know and you want to get it kind of moving a little bit quicker than right you know mm-hmm. you need to mash in a certain way yeah so it's 
again, it's just, you know, you're learning as you go and, and, and not, you know, from a completely blind standpoint, yeah. but uh, we made a conscious decision to mash for additional dextrins, thinking that maybe we're going to get more, you know, different fruit characters out of the Brett and turned out it, it no same, same them, character slowed them way down slow. yeah okay <laughs> so, okay yeah that's fascinating mm-hmm. um then, are you keeping both going now or are you moving in a in one particular direction we're gonna start mashing for dryness again okay um and that'll depend too is like we've we've kind of intentionally boxed ourselves into this we're gonna make traditionally yeah. made berliner rice and, and see where we can push it so i think there's room within there to you know make some that are you know you mash for dry or mash for residual too because right. Ultimately, they're going to have more residual sugar or, you know, residual dextrins in, in, in the final product. So there is a different flavor component to that of that sweet, sour play versus more of just a sour. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of oxygen control. You know, you know, certainly in these kinds of things, using old tanks, uh, um, you know, you want to uh, prevent some of those uh, more negative flavors from developing through your process. How do you uh, how do you manage that through your sour workflow? Yeah, we, so we do we do primary fermentation, and I mean I guess even backing up earlier, we we brew everything at the main brewery and we tanker the unfermented wort out to our sour production facility. Um, so your dad made you do this in a whole other place, <laughs> so you wouldn't mess with uh, yeah all the mainline beers. Yeah, we started in the main brewery, but uh, you know from a cross contamination standpoint, it's better to have them separated. Oh, plus, it's nice to have another tap room and another experience. Yeah, absolutely. There. Yeah. So we have a we have a sour dedicated tap room where you sit right in the middle of all the ten ten yeah, tanks. It's yeah. a pretty cool experience. But um, you know, we primary ferment stainless. When we go into the wood, we purge those ahead of time. So we're not you know we don't want a, a ton of oxygen going in there. It's already gone through primary fermentation. Um, as it ate, you know, it ferments out. It's fermenting very slowly so it's still generating co2 you know that's going up into the headspace we don't go all the way to the very top of the tank there's yeah. there's a, a, a gap there um you know knock on wood we haven't had any major acetic issues uh, we've had some tanks go bad that were caused by something else but um and then when we we empty them i mean we can't pressurize them but we we just draw very slowly with a right. co2 blanket so we're we're ob- you know very conscious about the the air contact that we're getting um you know we're going to go back into a bright tank that has been pre-purged and everything right, but everything right. from there you're treating it like regular beer so sure when you say you had some go bad what uh what was the root of that uh first one that ever went bad is you know berliner weiss doesn't go through a boil traditionally yeah. and we were doing one and you know we're in minnesota it's very cold uh in the middle of winter and it was like negative 10 outside, something like that. And our brew house is, is kind of a split level where the, you know, the door the access to the tanks is on top. And then all the, the majority of the kettles are down below and our temp probes right in the middle of that, the kettle. So we ran off into the tank and we thought we were at sterilization temp. Well, in reality, it had stratified within the kettle. The bottom never, or never got even close to, um, to, you know, pasteurization temperature. Yeah. So, when it went into the primary fermenter at, you know, two days into it, it smelled like just awful uh, rotten cheese. And so that one went down the drain. We had um, some issues early on. We were doing a split fermentation, kind of like that Berliner Kindle process. Uh, we would have some uh, yeast contamination in our lacto fermenter that, you know, were spontaneous or, you know, whatever wild yeast that produced some pretty off flavors that end up having to dump. And then, um, the last one we've had to dump was when we moved to our new facility, we got some used tanks that we were, uh, fermenting in they were old horizontal dairy tanks and the glycol jackets, um, you know, over the course of 50 years, that expansion contraction yeah. made like a hairline crack along the jacket on the inside of the tank. And so liquid was going in and out of the insulation. Yeah. And that was a, such a slow, uh, contamination that we had. Uh, a beer that was coming up on its one year anniversary that ended up having to dump because it was just straight nail polish. Yeah. So that's part of it. So you've got a number of years now into some of these tanks. Tell me about the, you know, managing that kind of culture within the tank. Um, you know, when you pull a batch, some, you know, you've mentioned you use the Solera method for some of the beers. Mm-hmm. Are you doing that for everything or are some you pulling fully out, cleaning out, you know, re, uh, repitching culture or is culture now just living and maintaining within those even when you, uh, you know, pull everything out? Yeah, we kind of have three different ways that we're, we're going about. Um, the majority of them, we, we try and clean the tanks uh, in between. 
Um, we would always go in with a little bit of residual um, fermentable EF, so we'd you'd get that Kreisen ring on the top of the tank. After two years, that Kreisen ring is just a ring of concrete. Yeah. So you try and um, clean that. You get to climb inside the tank yeah. with a brush, um, scrub that off, and then we go through like a winery cleaning process of like uh, soda ash, citric acid, um, and then those tanks don't have a spray ball, so we have a spray wand. Uh, that hooks up into the door and sprays it up, and you just have a sump that goes in the bottom of the tank. So you're removing all the solids, but you're not, I mean, from an actual sterilization or right, you know, cleaning right. standpoint, you're not, you're, we'd say it's just knocking it back close to zero. Um, so that's what we do for the majority of them. One beer, we f- did our first uh, New Belgium method where you just emptied the tank and filled it right back up. Yeah. Uh, and that has produced some really uh, cool results. And then the, the third way, is kind of that Schulteis method of, you know, adding back aged beer um, prior to going back into it. So kind of a, you know, depending on what we're trying to accomplish, we treat the, the tanks differently three different yeah. ways. You see you got fun results. What was uh, what made that stand out? Um, it was, I was just terrified to do it, you know, because it goes <laughs> against everything you're, you're trained to sure, you know, about sure. cleaning tanks and, and all that stuff. And um, early on, you know, you got that yeast autolysis that's happening, and it, it was – you know, just what have, I, what, have I, what, have I, what have I done here? You know, right, <laughs> you got all right. this dead yeast on the bottom. Um, then you just that, have to trust your bugs to yeah. uh, to clean that up, right? And when it cleans it up, it, it produces a really fantastic and complex character. I guess you're right. You're giving it more uh, more fun stuff to more mm-hmm. fun flavors to chew on. Yeah, yeah, and that's a common. It's a we're calling like a black Berliner Weiss, so it's almost like a, a you know it's like a sour porter, it's just right. an Imperial porter that. You also get a lot of play with those dark malts too, and some really like rich chocolates and you know raisins right. and plums. So, talk to, uh, let's talk a little bit about your fruit process. You know, you are mm-hmm. adding fruit in. You mentioned you know you uh, this latest Flanders style Berliner. Uh, you know, is aged for six months on cherries. Mm-hmm. What uh, what does that fruiting process look like for you, and how do you get the best fruit results out of that? Yeah, so we we move them when the beer is ready and in the wood tank. We've hit. Uh, we kind of monitor pH, gravity, and, and total acidity. When those have all leveled off and we've hit a pro- flavor profile that we like, we'll move it back into stainless, and that's where we add fruit. Um, so it's a, a fully fermented, finished beer. Uh, we have used puree, whole fruit, um, basically just those two. Um, I like puree because it's it's easy to use and it's already ground up. Um, yeah. But I, also, I mean, whole fruit is great as well. It's just a little, little harder to deal with it, uh, you know, afterwards. But... Um, so we'll add the fruit into the tank prior to moving the beer on top of it. So we'll, uh, we, we go pretty heavy handed on the fruit. Are you using stainless tanks for this? Yeah, this is yeah. all in stainless. Yeah. yeah, correct. Um, and then just in room temperature, no jackets or anything. So, and that's minimum three months, three to six months, hmm. kind of depending on the fruit that we're using three to four months kind of seems like the sweet spot to uh, have a really bright, some of the more tannic fruits, I think benefit from a little longer aging. Um, or if they don't have tannins to get, you know, extract some tannins too. So kind of letting the beer dictate what you're, what you want to do. And, mm-hmm. and if we're not ready for packaging, just moving it off the fruit ahead of time. Uh, we've done one beer, two beers now where we, um, after you move it off the fruit, put another beer on top of the, the leftover pulp. Right. And that's really interesting too. And that's a, it's a much more subtle character that you get of it. Basically no color extraction, but it's another, uh, different way of reusing the fruit to get, a softer fruit character. I've been a big fan of those second use and third use fruit beers, uh, mm-hmm. just because, right? You know, the the best examples that I've had uh, bring more beer character. Yeah, where that fruit becomes another flavor element without it being a fruit fruit beer. Yeah, um, you know, and I I'm just always biased towards beer that tastes a little more like beer, <laughs> than, like beer. than like fruit juice. But yeah, um, not, nothing against it. So I understand why people <laughs> love them. It's just you know my my personal taste certainly leans towards that type of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, in in terms of that kind of, of process, how do how do you? I mean, is it just a very fast drain and then and you know pop new new beer on top of it? I mean, if that stuff is sitting with any kind of uh, if that fruit that's already you know been extracted is just sitting around, I mean, it can go bad really quickly. Yeah, I mean, when we're we're pushing the beer out of the tank with CO two, yeah, so that whole tank is purged with CO two. So, right, right. Um, you know, it's essentially just a smaller you know, portion of beer in there because it's still a, yeah, a high yeah. portion of the air. So, yeah, being very conscious about, you know, managing oxygen and, and sure. that you're constantly using CO2. 
Yeah. So uh, what's big and next in the world of August Shell? Um, you know, what's uh, what are you now? I mean, it seems, seems like you've got a you know, pretty consistent sour program with, mm-hmm. with Star Keller. Uh, you've got some progressive loggers. You've you're on version four of your pills. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are uh, what are some of the projects that uh, are getting you excited now as you are rethinking and evaluating where Shell goes next? Yeah, uh, we've got a couple of things that are, are happening in the brewery. One, we're installing a pilot brewery, uh, something we've wanted to do for many years, but um, finally found a, a used German brew house that is very similar in its capabilities than yeah. the main brew house. So it's one-tenth the size. It's perfect for scaling up. It can still do all the same step mashes, decoction mashes that we do uh, with our main brew house. So I think that'll give us a lot of flexibility with trying smaller batch things because we do have a, a pretty good-sized brew house, and it, uh, it limits some of our flexibility in, in being nimble. Um, so that we're really excited about doing, and and um, a project that we've started a couple years ago, uh, we call it our Fort Road series, or um, where that beer is made with 100% locally grown barley uh, within 10 miles of the brewery. Uh, Minnesota at, in the 50s, 60s was the number one, number one growing barley state sure, in sure. the country, and now it has since basically moved completely out of the state. And so mm. this is our way of trying to bring it back. Um, and we're going to move that beer to our pilot system and, and have a lot more releases where it was just a Hellas in the, uh, in the past. Now we can have, you know, quarter releases. Um, working it's ironic with, since there's also large maltster uh, right there. And, well, yeah. And so, and part of that is um, we were getting it malted as a specialty malt. We, by the end of the year, will have 15% of all of our base malt uh, will be made with uh, our locally grown barley. Um, and that'll be our our base malt moving forward here. That fifteen um, percent or so of all of the beer that we make is made with locally grown barley. Everything. Yeah, the fifteen percent of the base malt for all the beers that we make is oh, made. That's, with fan- that's fantastic. Yeah. So Rar's been uh, helping us out and working in, in that we can blend it in with our, our base malt. We have a very uh, try and have a specific. Um, uh, malt flavor, you know, trying to mimic that more European flavor with a low modification, kind of yeah. a higher flavor. So we, we use 100% pinnacle, and so we have a we'll have a blend of the North Dakota grown pinnacle and our locally grown uh, Minnesota pinnacle. That's fantastic. They're making it just for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> which is difficult to do in the largest malt house in the world. So it's <laughs> it's a it's a you know we're in the fortunate position that we we do use a lot of barley. I mean, we're using a couple million pounds a year, yeah, and yeah. that we can do you know a 400 thousand pound bed. Is their smallest bed size at RAR? Yeah, uh, that we can utilize. You can use all that malt within one year. Yeah, um, so that's that's something I'm really excited about. That's been a long time in the works, and then next year's our 160th anniversary, um, and so we're, we got uh, some fun stuff planned for that with just you know anniversary celebrations stuff like that. We're gonna do a lot of beer deliveries with our beer wagon, and actually you know <laughs> delivering beer with the the horse drawn beer wagon. Yeah, um, we're gonna have a, a you know talking about lager beers, um, kind of a, a quarterly anniversary lager beer kind of like a double ipl type of a character where a, a lot of them are going to be that hybrid of you know american hops and german hops or new zealand hops and german hops so right, right. kind of blending the two worlds and traditional new world with, yeah with the well, beers. happy birthday jace <laughs> happy birthday to august shell thank you uh thank you for sharing your thoughts on brewing and uh it's been fascinating i i you know we've I've been a fan even ever since Stan uh, uh, made me go try your beer at uh, the beer festival a number awesome. of years ago. He's like, oh, you got to try this one. Like, uh, um, you know, and uh, uh, yeah, so it's fantastic to see that that legacy and that tradition uh, carry through for so many years. And uh, but also, you know, at the same time, continue on that uh, focus on progression yeah. and uh, you know, and addressing beer audiences where they are now and helping continue to move the conversation into the future. Absolutely. Um, if people it. want to learn uh, learn more about Shells, where do they find you uh, yeah, out there uh, in the world? Shellsbury.com is our website. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we're on, on those things. I think Shells Beer, at Shells Beer is our uh, handles for all those things. So check us out. Um, Starkeller has its own page as well, so you can kind of keep up with that. That's a, a our sour-only tap room, and we had a lot of you know tap room exclusive releases that we do there. So Sure. Uh, yeah, next week is our Oktoberfest. If you're going to be in Minnesota, come down. It's a super traditional, otherwise... Our Bach Fest is in the uh, you know, middle of winter in Minnesota. Yeah, it's a yeah. good excuse to get out and embrace the cold. So, yeah, I'm going to have to find some time to get up there. Uh, before we get out of here, G&D Chillers leads the way with innovative solutions. Tavor lets you explore the world of beer from the comfort of your home. 
Brew Guru alerts you to local discounts on beer, food, and homebrewing supplies, and Clarion Lubricants is the expert that experts trust. Jay Smarty, August Shell Brewery, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.